you know, please feel free to stop me at any time. Ask uh, ask questions, uh, especially since we have a small group. Ask whatever you want. We can go off on any tangents you're interested in and, and talk about whatever topics. Uh, okay, so we're going to talk about AOP, but the goal is not, my goal anyway, is not to just learn about a cool new tool, but to actually figure out how this is going to be helpful. And one of the things that AOP can do is it'll help us to reduce spaghetti code. Specifically, uh, we're talking about cross-cutting concerns. You'll hear that term a lot today. It's code that gets tangled up with other code. It's, it's uh, very much in the spaghetti code department. So we're going to try to tackle that problem today. And the other problem we're going to try to tackle is repetition and boilerplate. Uh, so the less of that stuff we have to write over and over again, the better. Um, you know, less is more. Let's, uh, let's avoid doing that. So that's the other thing that AOP is going to help us try to reduce. Uh, I wrote a book on AOP for Manning, and um, you can get it right now if you go to manning.com slash groves. And I also have a blog, which is not just about AOP anymore, but um, certainly do cover it a lot, crosscuttingconcerns.com. I try to post there regularly about all kinds of development stuff, so please give that a check if you get a chance. And at the end of the session, I'll give you a little coupon code if you're interested in purchasing my book at a discount. I'll give you uh, guys a special code that you can do that. Um, and uh, if you don't like my book, then just buy Joel's instead. <laughs> All right, so uh, I already mentioned cross-cutting concerns. And what does that actually mean? So a cross-cutting concern is some sort of functionality that touches multiple parts of your application. Um, it may go between more than one layer, so your UI layer, your business layer, your data layer. And in, inside those layers, it may go uh, across all the various modules within that layer. So let me give you some concrete examples. Uh, logging is sort of the classic use case for AOP. You, you may want to do some logging in the business layer, the data layer, the UI layer, and all over the place. So it cuts across all the different parts of your code. Another example is caching. You may want caching at the UI level, the business level, or even the data level. So that's something that you'll want to use, uh, maybe you want to use AOP to, to, to accomplish. Transactions, so when you do begin, commit, rollback, that's something that will take place in a lot of different places in your data layer, or perhaps your business layer. Defensive programming, so checking to see if a parameter is null, or zero, or negative, or something like that. Uh, you, you do that in a lot of places. And there's lots of other examples. I notify property changed. If you guys have done much um, desktop or mobile development, you might be familiar with the boilerplate from that. Authorization, validation, exception handling. These are all things that they're not necessarily features in and of themselves, but they do touch a lot of the features of your application, all the different layers. So this is what I mean when I say cross kind of concerns, these types of things. All right, so um, two more terms I want to introduce to you, scattering and tangling. Now, back in 97, these guys at Xerox uh, first were studying these issues of scattering and tangling, and they came up with the concept of, of AOP, of aspect-oriented programming. But it came about from them analyzing these large, uh, I guess they were Java programs at the time, these large Java programs, and figuring out what were some of the main reasons that were causing defects and bugs and regressions. And, uh, and they sort of identified these two things. So let's look at an example here. This is just some pseudocode of a couple of business modules, which is classes. And inside these classes, there's a couple of methods. And you can imagine, uh, there's just two on the screen, but you can imagine maybe 100 modules in a typical large project or more. Each of these modules has a number of methods. And each of these methods does some core operation. That's the green code here. And to do that core operation, it uses some core data members. So it may use a repository or a service or, or what have you. And uh, so that's great. That's a nice, uh, clean. Uh, module there. It's uh, single responsibility. It's uh, it's well written, well crafted. The problem is that's not what makes it into production. 
So by the time it gets to production, you need to add things like those cross-cutting concerns, logging, for instance, in this example. So you can see that I have to add a logging member to the business module. Maybe that's a n log instance or log for net or something like that. And then inside each method, maybe if I want to log the start and the end of each method call for performance checking or some sort of auditing, I have to put in some code to say, okay, method one is called log that method one was called at what time it was called, what parameters were passed in, etc. Then do core operation, and then log that I finished calling method one. So I, uh, maybe the return value, the time that it finished, and, and so on. And you have to do this over and over again. Um, now, it looks kind of nice here. It's just kind of a nice little layer, red, green, red. But in reality, uh, those, it's going to get more complex than that. So you'll have multiple places where you exit the method, uh, different pieces of logic in there, and that login code will then get mixed up with that core operation code. And so these guys identified that issue as tangling. So you have this cross-cutting concern and core operation getting mixed up together in the same method. And then additionally, we see that if you look at all the different methods here, in this module and the other modules, the same pattern sorts, sort of happens over and over again, uh, the same boilerplate. So I'm logging start, logging end, logging start, logging end. The only thing that's different maybe is the, the name of the method or the, the different parameters that are on there. But other than that, it's the same sort of boilerplate. And they call this issue scattering. So you have this... Uh, you have these two things happening, scattering and tangling, and they're causing defects and, and regressions because essentially these classes are no longer doing one thing. They're not single responsibility anymore. Now they're doing uh, two things. So one of them is the primary core operations, and one of them is a secondary uh, concern, and maybe you'll have two or three of those secondary concerns scattered up there. But the issue they saw was that there's not really a good way to solve this with plain object-oriented programming. And you could refactor this and, and try to reduce the repetition in boilerplate, but you're still putting code in those methods and classes that's touching everywhere, that has to be copied and pasted everywhere, even if it's just a small amount. So what they came up with is an approach they called aspect-oriented programming. So instead of those business modules having red and green code together, you would take all the red code out of the business module and leave it with just your core operations. So it's back to being single responsibility. You move all that red code into another class that's uh, a special kind of class called an aspect. And over in the aspect, you can see that I'm having the logging members over there. And then I have a method called begin method. This is all just pseudocode still. But if I apply this aspect to the business module, then whenever I call a method over there, it would run begin method first, then method one, and then back over to end method. And it would do this in a reusable way. So you would have just one aspect written, and you could apply it to business module one, business module two, et cetera, over and over again. So it's, it's not repetitive anymore. It's encapsulated into its own aspect. And then the AOP tool would be responsible for what's called weaving. So you're taking that aspect and mixing it back with the business module at some point after compile time. And so what ends up executing looks a lot like what we started with, this code here on the bottom, where it's all mixed together again. However, we're not writing and maintaining that code at the bottom. We're writing and maintaining the code on the top. So we have a nice clean separation of concerns, encapsulated and reusable. But what's executed is what we want executed down there at the bottom. Um, so it's, it's kind of like code generation, but it's generated after compile time and not before compile time. All right, so that's, the, that's sort of the basics there. Uh, so the rest of this session is mostly just coding, a lot of code focus here. So I want to give you a, a roadmap. Uh, but before we get started, any questions so far? You guys still there? I look like it. No. Okay. <laughs> well, I, actually, I do have one question. Sure. You said that the AOP is, is done after compile time, or is it actually during? Or what process during uh, compilation does that get injected into the IL? Right. So uh, that depends on the tool we're using. So I wanted to say after compile time to sort of be a catch-all. Uh, you know, some tools like Post Sharp are immediately after compile time. They're a post-compiler, like Post Sharp. 
Uh, but some tools are actually at runtime. They'll do this weaving at runtime. And either, in either case, it's after compile time. It's just a matter of how long after compile time. So I'll show you an example of both tools today, a post-compiler and a runtime uh, weaving tool. Okay. All right, so um, at my last uh, company I worked for, I wrote an aspect to deal with caching. I'm going to show you a very simplified example of that aspect that I wrote. Um, we're going to start, however, with no caching, just so you can see that uh, the application is is working. There's no caching happening. It's still taking the full time to do the operation. Then I'm going to add caching in a very naive way. I guess uh, the way I would do it, say, 10 years ago when I was a junior programmer first starting out. I'm going to try to refactor with some dependency injections. So we're going to use just plain C sharp, nothing, uh, no post compiler or anything like that to refactor it, just to see how that might look, uh, an attempt at refactoring. Um, I may do number four. We'll refactor it with a sort of functional style. Uh, not much different, but just to demonstrate that another approach. Then I'll refactor with a decorator. And this is just a des design pattern. We're still not using AOP at number five. We're just using a, a design pattern for C-sharp. And uh, we'll show you what that looks like. And you'll see why when we get there. And at that point, I'll switch over to, uh, I think we have plenty of time today, so we'll cover both Castle Dynamic Proxy and Post Sharp. And those are both AOP tools that I cover extensively in the book as well. Uh, I'll focus on those two today. There are other tools out there. Um, these are, I believe, the most popular ones. That's why I focus on them. But there's certainly other tools out there that are, um, you know, some variation of free, open source, commercial. There's a whole variety of them out there. So... Uh, I can certainly recommend some of those if you're interested, but these are the two that I mainly focus on. Okay, uh, I'm going to make some assumptions here. I'm going to assume that you guys right there in Boise are familiar with these things. So hoping you're familiar with C-Sharp and .NET, so I'm using a lot of that. I'm hoping you're familiar with MVC. It's not terribly important for this demo, but if you can follow it, it might be easier for you to understand what's going on. Uh, I hope you're familiar with uh, dependency injection and dependency inversion. I'll be using a bit of that today, especially with Castle. And I'm also using uh, an IOC tool called Structure Map. Now, if you're using, if you're not familiar with Structure Map, if you're more comfortable with Unity or Ninject, that's fine. But I'll be using Structure Map today. So is that uh, so? Anybody not comfortable with that? Um, I might, you know, if you have a question, feel free to stop me and uh, some detail you don't recognize. I'll be glad to explain it. Oh, looks like everyone's good. Okay. All right, so uh, I'm going to show you now the, the sample project that I'm working on. This is um, it's demo code. It's all contrived. Uh, I chose MVC because I'm familiar with it. It makes dependency injection pretty easy. Uh, but there's nothing special about it. AOP works just fine with web forms or, you know, whatever else, WPF or whatever else you want to use. Um, it's a reporting application. This one only has one report. Uh, with only a couple of parameters, but try to imagine an application with dozens or hundreds of reports with complex sets of parameters. Uh, there's three layers to this application, a UI, a service layer, and a data layer. The uh, service layer for this demo app essentially does nothing. It's just a pass-through. But in reality, you probably have more logic in there, um, validation or, or whatever. The data layer is not a real database. It's just an in-memory random number generator, essentially. But just try to imagine a SQL database on the other end. It's not terribly important for this for this demo. Uh, so there we go, random data. Uh, I'm also going to be using the ASP.NET built-in cache. There's, again, there's nothing special about it, but it's built in. It's easy. Uh, but you can certainly use other caching frameworks to your preference, Azure Caching or NCache or whatever. All right, so we're comfortable there. Let's switch over to some code. Okay, so let's see if the font's big enough. Can you see this okay? Yep, it's good. Okay. All right, so here is a controller, MVC controller, very simple. I'm getting in one service that's called report service an index method that just uh, sets up a, a, a basic view model. 
Um, I'm actually outputting the cache to the screen just for demonstration purposes, so that's what this is for here. And then the only post action is to validate the model and build up a report args object and pass that into my git report data service and put the results in the model. So I'll show you what that looks like here. This is, again, just the application with no caching. So here's my report. I enter a group ID, let's say one, two, three. A Boolean, do I include forums? No. Hit submit. Okay, now you'll notice it's taking some time for the results to come back. And this is what uh, a friend of mine called the walk of shame. It's actually going to the database and taking some time to get the results back. And see down here, there's nothing in the cache right now. So if I hit submit again, it's going to take the same amount of time. I think I put five seconds in here just to demonstrate the, whole, the full walk of shame. So because this is an expensive report, it takes some time to get results back. Um, and it's a report the data doesn't change very often, so it's a good candidate for caching. All right. <clears throat> So uh, here's my service right now, my report service. It has no caching in it. It's just a simple pass through to this data service. I'm going to go look at the data service here. All it's doing is sleeping for five seconds and then putting some random numbers in the results here. So you can imagine an expensive SQL call or a web service call would, would go here in a real application. So. Um, I, I identify that I want to add caching, and I want to add it to the service layer here. So how would I go about doing that? So let's start with the sort of simplistic uh, approach to the service here. And it might look something like this. So the same report service as before, same dependency on data service. But here's my new get report data method. So here's that get data call right there where it was before. So that's the green code that I'm highlighting right there. Everything else around it is red code. So I'm first constructing a cache key, because ASP.NET cache, you need a key to store the data. And I'm creating that cache key based on the parameters being passed in. So the group ID and the forms included, Boolean, with an underscore between them. That way, if someone passes in another request with the same arguments, I can pull that value from the cache. Once I have the key constructed, I'm looking in the HTTP ASP.NET current cache, see if that cache key is in there. If it is, return it. So this is the cache hit. It's already in the cache. Go ahead and return the value. If it's not in the cache, then run the full report, do a walk of shame on line 26. And after we're done with the walk of shame, take that result and store it back in the cache using that cache key. So there's the key, there's the result. The rest of this is just some noise to say stored in the cache for 30 seconds, which is not realistic, but it's a demo app. All right. So let's run that in the browser and see how it behaves. We're back to our report app here. So someone give me a group ID number. Shout it out. 211. 211. Do you like forums? Sure. Okay. I hit submit. It's the first time. Nothing in the cache. It's doing the walk of shame. So now it returns back. And now notice this time there's something in the cache. This is the cache key, 211 underscore true. And it's storing a report results object in there. So if I hit submit again within that 30 second window, it's going to very quickly give me the result. You probably can't even tell from. Uh, the screen share that this is a very quick page refresh. After 30 seconds, that will expire. And let's see if we can wait out the 30 seconds here. Notice it's the same values every time. Okay, now it's doing the walk of shame again. And now we have a new set of values. So you can see the cache is, in fact, working. So success, right? Ship it. But can anyone tell me what the problem might be with uh, writing code like this? Nothing? Looks good? What's that? You're going to be writing that code over and over again. Right. So if I have one of these methods for each report, I've got to copy and paste this same mess each time. So clearly this is not 
the best way to go. I mean, if it's just one report and that's it, then this is probably fine. But if it's a system with dozens or hundreds of reports, we we got to refactor it somehow. So that's not going to work. So let's try another approach. Let's refactor using some dependency injection. So here is um, a new version of reports. So I'm going to create what's what I'm going to call a cache service. Oh, one other problem I should mention is that the way we wrote it here, this report service object is now directly coupled to HTTP context. So it's directly coupled to ASP.NET cache. So if we want to change caching framework, we've got to go and change code in this class. So it's definitely not same responsibility. It's definitely tightly coupled to a specific caching technology. So let's create a cache service to help solve that problem. So I create an interface with three methods. Is something cached? Let's set a cache value and let's get a cache value. Three basic operations for caching. So this odd implementation of this that acts as sort of a wrapper around ASP.NET cache. So check to see if it's already in the cache somewhere. Uh, add it for 30 seconds and then get it back out from the cache. All right. So I create a service there. And now back in my report service, I have another dependency that I'm adding to the constructor, iCache service. So it's all using dependency injection. And now down here in my get report data, instead of calling HTTP context, I'm, I'm calling this cache service object here. So now it's no longer tightly coupled to the ASP.NET cache. So that's an improvement. It makes it easier to test, certainly. And it's a little bit cleaner as well. We don't have all the extra caching noise in there. But there's still the problem of having to copy and paste this code here, this red code here, and this red code here to every single one of these methods. So we're taking a step in the right direction, but it's not quite there just yet. So dependency injection uh, will help a little bit. It'll help some problems, but it doesn't help our boilerplate repetition problem. So one example I see sometimes people will talk about this as a, a better approach is to take a functional approach to it. So instead of the cache service, now I'll create something called a cache wrapper. And this is a little more complex. It involves um, funk and some callback type of things. But so now I have this one method called cache wrap. You see it's a generic uh, type parameter. And down here, you can see it looks like a lot of the same code as before, uh, checking to see if it's in a cache. Uh, and then, but this time, instead of calling the, a specific method, it's calling a generic method that's being passed in. And then it's returning the, uh, adding the method, or adding the results to the cache. So back over here, in report data, Notice that what I've done is I've taken this green code and I'm, I've put it into this, this funk, the callback here. So I'm essentially wrapping the main body of the method in this funk and passing it to this cache wrap. So it's something like a decorator, but it's a functional decorator. It's, it's very much like, a, like an F-sharp type approach. You're just wrapping it with a, with a function. So this is, this is, again, a little better. It's a little more complex to understand what's going on here with, with the funks and the callbacks and the wrapping and the whole thing. But it's a little better. But notice we still have an issue. We still have this cache key that we have to construct in the method here. Because I can't think of a generic way to get those parameters out of this object here unless I put some sort of common interface on it. And I still have to have this extra noise of the, of the funk wrapper in there. Excuse me. So we're getting there, but we're still not quite there. We still have to do a lot of boilerplate and copy and pasting. All right, so let's do let's do one more possible approach we could take to it. So, uh, any of you guys familiar with the decorator pattern? Yes. Anybody read the uh, design? People that aren't. That aren't okay. So, uh, you know, 
definitely get a chance to check out one of the design pattern books, like Head First Design Patterns or Gang of Four Design Patterns. Uh, I'll try to show you here really quickly what uh, a decorator means. So I've created a new object here, a new class here, called Report Cache Decorator. And notice that it implements the same interface as my report service. So it has the same signature as that. The difference is that the constructor to this takes in an object of the same interface. So it's acting as sort of an intermediate, like a, a wrapper around the inner object, the actual report service. And then take a look at the get report data method for this. So notice that it's that same red code we've been slinging around the whole time. Uh, and then instead of calling the actual report service, I'm going to call, or instead of, yeah, so I'm calling that targeted report service here. So I'm wrapping this decorator around the real report service. So if we go back to my new report service, you can see that it looks like it should. It's all green code. So none of that caching stuff is here. So then the question you might... I see a lot of NVVM developers think they're doing NVVM, yeah. but they're really doing decorator. <laughs> okay. Because they'll create like a person view model, and then all they'll do is expose properties that return an internal instance of a person and that property, right? So they'll mm. re-expose properties of the model itself, which is yes. just yes. creating a wrapper around it, which is a right. decorator. It's not NVVM. Yes, it's, yeah, it's very, very similar. So that may be more of like a, uh, a different approach, like a facade approach or something like that, um, because they're not using the same interface. That's the key to the decorator pattern is my report service implements this interface, and so does the decorator pattern for the decorator class, the same exact interface. So then the question might be, well, how do I get them to, to hook, up, hook up with each other? Well, the answer to that is in your IOC. So if I can find where I put my IOC stuff, let's see. Oh, yeah, right here. So like I said, I'm using structure map, and this is some very, very basic structure map here. I'm initializing my container to scan the whole assembly and use default convention. So if you guys aren't familiar with that, default convention is basically you have an interface that starts with an I, and you have the implementation that doesn't start with the I. So if I have I foo, the convention says foo is the implementation of that. All right, so structure map does that for us, and we just say with, con with default conventions. But if I were to be explicit, I could say, okay, structure map, whenever someone asks me for an object that implements I report service, I want you to return an I want you to return a new instance of report service. All right, so we could just say this explicitly for every single one of our classes. Uh, we don't have to because of this default convention. But now I want to say, okay, for this specific one, if anyone asks for a report service, I want you to return a new report service object, and I want you to decorate it with a report cache decorator. So you can see I'm newing up report cache decorator, and I'm passing in the actual report service into there. So it's acting as a wrapper around that. Uh, so that, that's how you do it in a structure map. Other uh, IOC tools have very similar capabilities of doing decoration like this. Uh, and so this way, the only way those are coupled is in your IOC container. Otherwise, they're very loosely coupled. So let's bring this up in a browser so you can see that it works. Uh, someone shout out a group ID. 25. 25. 25. No one does 42 yet? Uh, include forums. Do you like forums? Not this time. No, no forums. All right, submit. Now it's doing the walk of shame. Chrome is spinning around, waiting for a response. Okay, there we go. You can see that my decorator has created a new object in cache with that cache key, 25 and false, with report results. If I hit submit again, it will very quickly give me the results back, just like before. All right, so... Not terribly different, just the way we've done it is, is a little different. All right, so we've, we've got a pretty good uh, situation going here. We have our report service is very clean. It's just our green code. We've got all the cache stuff over in its own class, cache, cache decorator. So this is, I think, probably the best we can do with just plain C Sharp right now is using this decorator pattern. 
Uh, but can anyone see what might be an issue doing it this way? I mean, clearly this is more improved than the last few examples, but can anyone still see some issues with doing it this way? It locks you to using that particular interface, so you couldn't use it on another interface without re-implementing a new decorator. Absolutely right. So uh, this only works for iReport service. If I have a dozen different report services, then I need a dozen different decorators. So what I'm doing is just sort of shifting around that repetitive code to a new place. And don't get me wrong, this is still better because you can now put those decorators uh, on their own and work on refactoring those, and you still have the code in a relatively, uh, you know, relatively encapsulated place, but it's still a lot of repetitive code you have to write. So I would, I would argue that this is not tangled anymore, so we would remove the tangling problem, but it's still scattered because we still have to write those decorators over and over again. So wouldn't it be nice if we had a tool that would write these decorators for us? So all we have to do is just write the code in here, uh, all the red code, and then the framework would take care of creating those decorators for us on the fly. And that essentially is what AOP is. It's a automatic decorator generator. Uh, so that's what we'll look at next. So any questions so far before we dive into actually using some tools? Nope. Okay, cool. All right, so the first one I'll show you is called Castle Dynamic Proxy. And this is a tool that's part of uh, the Castle framework. Uh, you guys might be familiar with Castle Windsor, uh, those uh, tools. Uh, this is part of the Castle Core uh, library. So if I bring up NuGet here, you'll see I've got Castle Core installed here. And uh, Castle Core includes a couple of things. Uh, some logging and dictionary adapter, but it also includes this neat little tool called Dynamic Proxy. If you guys have ever used um, in Hibernate before, you might be, have heard of Dynamic Proxy sort of being included there. Um, other tools, I think mocking tools use it from time to time, like uh, mock MOQ, I think uses Dynamic Proxy. So you might have heard of this before. We're going to actually use it directly this time. Okay, so to use this tool, we uh, I've already, I already had Castle Core to the project. It's just a NuGet install, uh, install package, castle.core. And this package includes this interface here called iInterceptor. So I'm going to create a interceptor class. This is essentially an aspect. Now, they don't call it aspects in dynamic proxy. They call them interceptors, but it's the same thing. So I implement this interface. It has one method on it called intercept. And that method intercept gets one argument passed in, or one parameter passed in, that's of type I invocation. So this method will be called whenever I'm intercepting a call to a method. So whenever someone makes a call to my report service, Castle's going to intercept, take over, and it's going to call this code instead. An iInvocation object is going to give us information about that method being intercepted. Uh, the method's name, the parameters, the arguments, return value, and so on. So inside this intercept method, we're doing a lot of that red code again. So I'm constructing the cache key, just like before. Uh, more, actually, not just like before, but we'll get to that in a second. I'm checking to see if that key is already in the cache. If it is already in the cache, use that invocation object to set the return value of the method to the value from the cache. So set the return value and then return immediately. So when I return, I'm not actually calling the method that I'm intercepting. It's just sort of short-circuiting it and returning the value from the cache. If it's not in the cache, invocation.proceed means it's going to go ahead and call the method being intercepted. So it proceeds to the next uh, proceeds to the next method that's being intercepted, <clears throat> and then when that's done, I want to use that cache key and get the return value back out of that invocation object and store that return value in the cache with that key for next time. All right. So does everyone follow that? Okay. Well, basically, I'm interacting with the method 
by using this invocation object. Now, one thing that I'm doing a little differently than before is the way I'm building this cache key. So I don't have direct access to uh, a strongly typed version of every single parameter object that gets passed in here, right? So I have to access it in, in a generic way. So I'm passing this to a, a method I call build cache key. So down here, one of the values that the invocation object has is this arguments property, which is just an object array of all the arguments being passed into the method. All right? So what I'm doing is uh, I need to create a unique value that corresponds to those, those arguments being passed in to create my cache key. So I'm taking all those arguments, selecting all of them, and I'm actually serializing them into JSON, just a, a string of JSON that represents the values of the object being passed in as the arguments. And I'm joining them all together with an underscore. If there's more than one argument being passed in, I'll join them together. So you'll see what this looks like here in a second. But this is, this is a generic way to build out a cache key so that it'll work with any method that I want to apply this interceptor to. All right, and if we go here and look at my report service, so step number six, this is the one that works with Castle. And you'll see it looks just like the one before. It's all green code. There's no caching code in here at all. So uh, again, you might be asking, well, how do I make this interceptor talk, to, talk with and work with this report service? And the answer again is IOC. So back here, <coughs> excuse me. So back here with IOC, notice that before I had this just decorated with my cache, that, cache decorator that I wrote by hand. But now we're going to make uh, Castle do all the work. So we'll new up this uh, Castle object that's this proxy generator. This is supplied by Castle. Whenever someone asks for a re report service, we'll use the report service object. But we're going to decorate it with, and this is kind of long, the big font, it's hard to fit on the screen. We're going to use a proxy generator to create an interface proxy with the target interface. And that method takes in uh, the object, the iReport service object, and we're going to use that cache interceptor that we wrote to generate this new object. This is going to be a in a class that's generated at runtime. So it's going to use reflection to create a new class that implements that interface and does all of our cache interceptor work for us. So I don't have to write report cache decorator or a dozen report cache decorators. I just have to write one cache interceptor and apply it by generating a class at runtime with Castle. So uh, it'll, it'll work the same, but it'll look a little different here. Let me uh, go ahead and show you in a browser. So shout out a group ID number. 42. There it is, 42. You like forums? No. No? Okay. Hit submit. First time hitting the cache, so it's a walk of shame. Taking the full five seconds. So now I get the results back. I'm noticing my cache. Let me zoom in here a little bit so you guys can read this. Here's my new cache key. It's a JSON string. So it's getting the, all the properties of that object and serializing them to a nice string that's unique to those arguments that I passed in. And then the report results are stored there. So if I hit submit again, it's going to again discover that in the cache. If I add another one, like 45, do the walk of shame. And now you'll see that... I'll have, oh, didn't do it fast enough. Let's do another one, 49. So I have 45 and 49. Those should be in the cache right now. And notice my cache keys are slightly different. So this one's 49, this one's 45. So those caches store two different report results, objects, and it's, the cache key is just a JSON string. Now I use JSON because I think JSON is nice and compact and readable. Uh, you could certainly use uh, XML or, um, you know, some other serialization or some other technique to generate this cache key. But it has to be one that's generic enough so that I can reuse this cache interceptor 
anywhere I want to. I use the built-in JavaScript serializer. You could use Newton Soft instead. I'd probably recommend doing that. It'd be faster. So I know that's probably a lot to take in, but um, what do you think? Any questions so far? No questions? No so questions? Either, these are very, very clear or very, very confusing. <laughs> All right. So that's, that's Castle. And Castle, like I said, works with reflection. So when I call this create interface proxy with target interface method, it will call reflection.emit, and it will actually spin up reflection to create a brand new type at runtime. So there is something of a runtime performance penalty to this. Um, because, you, you know, using reflection, reflection is relatively slow. However, once you create this class the first time, it's, it's cached. So it's only a one-time penalty. Um, so it's, it's really not that bad. And considering the sort of time you're going to be saving uh, in, in bugs and in writing repetitive code, I think it's a pretty reasonable trade-off. But it is something to be aware of that it is doing this at runtime. And if you don't have uh, the ability to use reflection emit at runtime, if it's some sort of uh, .NET subset or uh, medium or low trust, well, maybe low trust, you probably can't use reflection emit. So you probably can't use Castle. All right, so how exactly does the AOP know what method to call? Is it just called the interface method that's on the service? Right, right, exactly. So it, all it's doing is just creating... A decorator. So just imagine it's creating this same decorator class for me at runtime, but it doesn't exist in my source code. It all, it all exists at runtime. So it's just wrapping that internal report service, the real one, with a decorator that it's generating at runtime. So it's it's called dynamic proxy. I really wish it was called dynamic decorator instead, because that's what it, really what it is. Okay. So what if you had more than one contract in your interface? Is it? Do you tell it which? Which contract to invoke? I see. Right. So, so by default, this intercept will be applied to every public method of that uh, interface. Um, now, there are some ways you can narrow it down to say I only want it to run on certain uh, methods or uh, you know just one method. There are some ways to do that with Castle. It's not quite uh, nearly as elegant as the next tool I'm going to show you post sharp, but there is a way you can do that. But, but Excuse me. By default, it does the entire interface. So it would, if I had more than one method on um, my report service, where is it? Uh, no, right here. It's decoration. So if I had more than one method here, so if I had method two, method three, etc., it would apply that interceptor to each one of these methods, just by default. And um, so the proceed is the, the line of code that is calling that method, and you get the result from that method call, right? Is that what's happening in your interceptor? Yes. So right here, when, when proceed happens, it calls the method as normal and actually stores the return value in this invocation object, return value. So before this proceed runs, return value is just going to be null. It's not set at all. It's not set until after proceed runs. Can you control the order in which those uh, public methods are invoked? The order in which they're invoked? Yeah, so is it are they invoked in the order in which they're defined in the interface, or is it alphabetical, or how does it determine what order it invokes all of the contract methods? Uh, so wh whenever the method is executed, that's when the interceptor will take over. So it, it's actually wrapping it. It will actually call the interceptor method um, right. the so dynamic right. If you go back to yeah. report service, I report yeah. service. Yeah. Let's say you had method two and method three defined underneath get report data. Yeah. What order would each of those methods get called? Since the interceptor applies to all three, which order is it? The order in which they're defined in the interface? Well, I I, I don't quite understand why uh, ordering would matter in that context because the interceptor code won't get run until you call this method. So the ordering doesn't, doesn't really matter about these at all. So just imagine I had a, a, a real decorator um, wrapped around this object. Whenever I call, whenever I think I'm calling 
So if I go back to my controller here, let's see. Uh, controller, controller, home controller, right here. So right here is where I'm calling get report data on that object of type I report service, right? Okay, I got it. Right. But because my IOC is passing in the uh, dynamic proxy object, I'd be calling that right here. And then it, in turn, would turn around and call the real report data method, assuming, you know, it needed to actually call it and not just pull it from the cache. All right. It cleared up for me. Okay. Good. Good. All right. Okay. So that is Castle Dynamic Proxy. Um, it's a free open source tool. It's been around a long time. Lots of projects use it. Uh, it's one that I spend a lot of time focusing on in uh, the book. One of the downsides to Dynamic Proxy, though, is besides the reflection emit, which I don't think is a big deal, uh, the other issue is that you can't really apply these interceptors to code that's not implementing an interface. Um, so if you're doing a Greenfield app and you've got all your nice IOC containers wired up and all your services are there and all implementing interfaces, then you're fine. Um, but if there's code that does not implement an interface that you still want to put a cross-cutting concern around, like caching or logging or whatever, then Castle is really not going to help you. Uh, alternatively, instead of an interface, you could make it a virtual method and do it that way, but then that's, you know, that may be a uh, cause issues of its own. So if you guys are familiar with nHibernate, if you remember, you have to make all your nHibernate entities virtual properties, right? And this is why, because nHibernate uses Castle Dynamic Proxy to handle all this lazy loading stuff. So, um, that's why if you don't use an interface, you'll have to make a virtual method. So in, in either case, you'll have to possibly adapt your code so that you can use Castle Dynamic Proxy, which is fine. I mean, you should be using interfaces as much as possible to make your code uh, more testable. But it's not always possible in some situations. So let's go on to another tool, unless you guys have more questions here. Uh, the next one I'll be talking about is called PostSharp. And like I said, I'm a bit biased because it's just a tool that I've been using for a long time and I'm a PostSharp MVP and the whole thing. Uh, but it's also a very cool, very powerful tool. It's also available on NuGet. Just install package PostSharp. And it will add a reference to your project here, PostSharp. It will also install a program, which is the post compiler. Because the way PostSharp works is that instead of using reflection at runtime, it will actually take your compiled code and manipulate the IL directly to, to change your code, to add in all that, to do all the weaving we talked about. So if you decompile your DLL, it will look different than, you, than the code you wrote, for instance. Uh, some people aren't terribly comfortable with that. Uh, but PostSharp does a really good job of doing that, and um, it's also, uh, you know, it's something that if you look, if you take a decompiler and, and just take a look at it, it might make you a little more comfortable with what it's actually doing in there. So it's maybe it may seem a little scary at first, but it's actually uh, pretty cool. All right, so let's take a look at this thing in action. So here's my report service. Um, Pretty much the same as before, all green code in here, no major differences. Some of the more astute of you might have noticed something already, but we'll come back to that. So now I'm creating something called a cache aspect. So I've already added PostSharp to this project. I'm creating a new object called cache aspect, and it inherits from this base class here that comes with PostSharp. There's several of these. I'm using the one called method interception aspect, which is very similar to the interception uh, interceptor from before we saw in Castle. It's, it's very, very similar. Uh, there's one method you can override. Well, there's several methods, but the, the main one we're going to override is called on invoke, which is just like on an intercept. It gets an object passed in called method interception args, which contains similar contextual information about the method, the method name, the arguments, the return value, etc. So this code is almost identical to what we had before. We're still building the cache key. We're still checking the cache. 
we're using return value to put the value in the uh, – to take the value from the cache and return it. We're still going args.proceed to continue with the method, and we're taking the return value and putting it in the cache afterwards. And you can see it build cache keys exactly the same as before, using JSON and serializing all those arguments to build a unique key. So then the question is, how do I get this aspect to talk to my report service? And the answer this time is not IOC. In fact, PostSharp does not uh, need IOC at all, which, is, which isn't to say you shouldn't use IOC, just that PostSharp doesn't need to use uh, IOC. So the way you do it with PostSharp is you take that cache aspect object and add it as an attribute on the method you want to enhance with PostSharp. So you can see I've added cache aspect to this get report data method. So that means now PostSharp is targeting this specific method with this specific aspect. So you can see that it's a little more powerful than, than Castle because you don't need to worry about interfaces or virtual or anything like that. You can also use it on private methods, on static methods, uh, and so on, even on uh, third-party libraries, which is not officially supported, by the way, but it's, it's a possibility. Um, so that's how that works there. So there's, there's nothing special in IOC right now. It's just an attribute. So let me go ahead and compile. And so you can see down here, I don't know if this is very visible to you, but in, post, or in the output here, we can see that PostSharp is taking over after the main compilation, and it's running its own post-compiler process on your code. And it took about 415 milliseconds to do that. So that is the sort of the performance trade-off here is that Castle does all its work at runtime. PostSharp does all its work at compile time. If you have a very, very large project with lots of aspects, this could add some noticeable time to your build, um, maybe a few seconds. Uh, if that's gotten a lot better in recent years. It used to be, you know, maybe a lot slower than that, maybe 10 seconds or something. Um, and this also, because the way this works, it also needs to exist on your build server, unlike Castle, which is just part of, uh, you know, uses reflection. PostSharp needs to be installed on your build server uh, in order for it to work, and that needs to be installed on everybody's machine on the project that's, that's doing this to compile it. Uh, so that's a little different with PostSharp, but fortunately with NuGet, these days it's so much easier to, to do that than it was before. All right, so let's, uh, let's go ahead and run it so I can prove to you that it works. It's going to be very, very exciting. Someone give me a group ID number. Twelve. Twelve. Do you like forums? Nah. Nah, no one likes forums. Okay. Hit submit, doing the walk of shame. And there we go. Same result as before. We have the JSON key down here. We'll do another one. Oh, we'll just do this one again. Getting it very quickly. Click, click, click. We'll do 45 for doing the walk of shame. Take a, a long time to get this one. Then we'll have two values in the cache. All right. So that's uh, that's PostSharp. We wrote a very, very simple PostSharp aspect. Um, I use the interception one. There's a couple other varieties of PostSharp aspects. You can also have a property interception aspect, so not just methods, but also properties, or fields. You can intercept fields. There's another variation of method aspects called uh, method boundary, which um, is slightly different way to approach it, slightly different semantically. It has some performance implications, but relatively the same thing. Uh, and so that is, that is it. That's all the way up through PostSharp and Castle. So, um, any questions? Do you, uh, do you feel that your application gets polluted with a ton of attributes by using uh, PostSharp? Very good question. So, uh, one thing you might notice is I have this, as this attribute here. If I have a hundred other methods or you know, dozens of other classes, I have to use the same attribute over and over, right? Well, there are some ways to improve that. So, the first way, we can bump it up to the class level. I could take this attribute up here and put it up here. And now this aspect will be applied to every method in the class. So I've already reduced my attribute usage 
a little bit by just doing that. All right? Uh, another way we can do it is actually at the assembly level. We could go up to, uh, let's see, like assembly info here, which I don't have an example. Uh, but I can apply it at the assembly level. I can say uh, cache aspect. And then I can use something like, um, uh, I don't remember what the exact uh, syntax is. I'll have to look it up real quick. But you can apply it to a specific namespace and say, okay, every class in this namespace, uh, the services namespace or the repositories namespace or what have you, uh, will get get this aspect applied to it. And you can apply regular expression to it. So you can say every class that ends in the word repository or, uh, or so on. You can, you know, a lot of customization about where you can apply uh, these aspects. Let me see if I can find an example here Pretty quickly. <clears throat> okay, so here is one that I have from a real project that I'm working on. And uh, it's not going to work because it's not in this project, but I, I have an interceptor I wrote for transaction scope. And I'm saying I want you to apply it to uh, every class in this namespace. So this namespace dot star and aspect priority, which we won't talk about. So everything in that namespace apply this aspect to. So I have a lot of control. I can go very, very broad or very, very granular with push sharp. Do you find that uh, using AOP introduces any challenges in testing? Absolutely. Have you been reading my book? Because <laughs> I spend the whole chapter on this. Um, so, yeah, that's definitely another consideration, another trade-off between Castle and PostSharp is because Castle happens all at runtime, it's so much easier to write unit tests when Castle is involved. With post sharp involved, it's a little more challenging because you're essentially unit testing against your code that's already combined. It's already red and green mixed together. So it's a little more work. And I go through this in detail in the book. There's a couple, and actually I have a slide about it as well. Uh, when I wrap up here, I'll, I'll talk about it some more. But there's definitely some more work you have to do with unit testing and post sharp. Um, however, I don't think it's tremendously uh, a tremendous burden. It's just you have to think a little more carefully about running your unit tests and maybe a little bit more work in your setup, your unit test setup. But if, if that power of PostSharp is worth it to you, then I think it's definitely worth that trade-off. Um, but, but like I said, if you're doing all Greenfield and all interfaces, Castle is a really great approach as well. So when you install PostSharp, how does it in, in, uh, tell your project to add that post compiler uh, process at the end? Does it modify uh, your project file, or does it, I mean, how does it actually tell it to do that, to run that post process? Yeah, so, so NuGet, the NuGet package will actually modify your, your CS proj here. Let's see if I can find it, uh, push sharp. Uh, let's see, that's references, yeah, right here. So uh, there's this post sharp targets file that comes with the NuGet package, and that's just referenced here in the CS proj. So, I mean, there's other ways you can do it, but the NuGet package just sort of does all that work for you. And I've even used that on uh, a Team City server. It's worked just fine. Um, so that is uh, really, really easy to do. Where do you find AOP most useful? Logging? Uh Debugging, uh, you know, reporting. I mean, where, where's the when you use it in your production applications? Where do you use it most often? So those cross-cutting concerns I mentioned are a great place to use AOP, um, no matter which tool it is, PostSharp or Castle. Uh, so when you find yourself writing a lot of the same boilerplate over and over again, um, that is where you should consider using AOP. So logging is 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 the killer app for AOP. That's sort of the reason it was it was. Uh, it's, it's taken off as much as it has because it's so easy to drop in a logging aspect. Uh, in, in projects of mine, I've shipped software that used it for caching, like I'm showing you today. A little more complex than this, but uh, I've shipped a ca caching aspect. We've also used it for licensing. So certain parts of our API should not work depending on what license the user has. So we use AOP to enforce that. Uh, a project I'm working on right now, I'm using it for exception handling to, you know, log an exception, try to handle an exception if possible, um, 
And if not, you can just, you know, show a graceful error message to the user. So I don't have to write that same code over and over again. And I'm also using it for transaction scope. So begin, begin transaction, commit transaction, or if there's an exception, roll back transaction. So do you um, so use ALP in every app you write? <laughs> um, just about. And, and actually, if most of you guys have used MVC before, chances are you're using AOP already and you just don't know it. Um, if you do a file new MVC, you'll often see a uh, account controller in there, and it will have an authorized attribute on it. Now, that, that's not post sharp attribute. That's an, uh, an MVC action filter. But it is essentially an aspect. So if you've ever used an action filter before, congratulations, you can put AOP on your resume. Um, or if you've used an HTTP module before, those are very much aspects in my view. So they're not called aspects, but the, they are aspects. So, so, so yeah, pretty much used in every project. <laughs> I see the notify other. property change. Project down there. Can you give me a quick yeah. look at, at how that? Oh, might I was afraid you were going to ask about that. Uh, so keep in mind, I haven't really dusted this off in a while because I usually present to mostly web guys. But yeah, I, I mentioned briefly that uh, I notify property changed is uh, a way where uh, AOP can really be valuable. So let me just see if this works here. Let me fire up this project. I'm not much of a desktop developer, so don't don't laugh in my project here. But I've got, um, I guess this is WPF, but the same applies to any sort of XAML-based project or MVVM project. I have a first name, so if I put in Alan and then Turing, notice that the full name populates as I'm typing. So this is really MVVM 101, right? Very, very simple. So let's take a look at that. <clears throat> uh, I have a named human model. So let me bring up my XAML here first. Again, don't laugh. This is not like what I normally do. But here's my app, right? And I have these these different controls here bound to first name, last name, and full name properties of my model. And here's my model. I have a first name property, which just has a backing field, private backing field. A last name property, private backing field. And then I have a full name property, which is not backed by anything. It's just derived from those other two fields. All right. So uh, if you're familiar with I notify property chain, some of this should look familiar to you. I have to implement this interface for it to trigger those updates in the, um, the main window there. So whenever I get the property, just return the backing value. But whenever the property is changed, I have to check to see if it's different, set the backing field, notify that this property changed, which is first name, right? We can use the call member name now to do that for us automatically. But then I also have to notify that this full name property updates because it's derived from, from me, from this first name property. So I'm notifying that that property is also being changed. So I have to do that again with the last name, same bit of extra noise and ceremony down here. And so this is an extremely simple view model, right? There's not much to it. However, it's 50 lines just for three properties which I just, I don't know, I find that a little bit hard to look at personally. Uh, I don't really like that at all. And, I, you know, I've, I've done some MVVM with uh, Android and, and Windows Phone, MVVM Cross. The same sort of thing happens there. Um, so that's a real pain in the neck. I mean, this is not that complex at all. There's a lot of extra noise in here. So we can use, we can use AOP to get around that. So in this particular project, I've got another AOP tool that I want to show you. It's called Fody, F-O-D-Y, and it's installed with NuGet as well. Just install package Fody, and Fody is not an AOP tool itself. It's uh, let me just bring it up here. What do they call themselves? They call themselves an extensible tool for weaving .NET assemblies. So it's sort of a a framework, if you will, for manipulating IL code, and it has several plugins that you can install with it. And the one I've installed here is called propertychanged.fody. And it, it allows us to write much nicer view models that implement iNotify property change. So let's bring up the Fody example here. So here's my new name view model. 
for FODI. Notice that this doesn't even implement the interface. There's no I notify property changed right here. It's just a plain old property with auto getters, auto setters, and this plain old derived property here. The only difference is I add this attribute to it, implement property changed. So when I compile this, FODI is again a, a post compiler. So it's going to take over at compiling and manipulate my code. So you can see down here, kind of small, but you can see at the bottom, FODI is taking over. It took 768 milliseconds to modify my uh, IL. <clears throat> and let's run the app. See, it's working the same way as before. So FODI is kind of interesting because uh, if you look at the references here, FODI is not anywhere in here. So FODI it sort of takes over at compile time, but you don't need to actually deploy it with your, with your project, unlike PostSharp, you need a PostSharp reference in your project. So that's kind of a, a cool little feature of FODI. Um, I do have to have reference to property change to plug in because I'm using this uh, attribute right here. But uh, I know this is, is an attribute here, but personally I'd rather look at this than that big mess of on property changed and backer properties and all that. So is FODI just, is that implement property change, uh, is, is that just calling the notify property change with an empty parameter for the property name to, to update all of them? So what FODI is doing is it's actually going into the IL and it's implementing this class itself. So if I decompile this project, you'll see that name view model actually is implementing I notify property change. And it has all the extra noise that it needs in here, but FODI is doing that for us. Right. Let's see I'm, if I can do that. Yeah, I'm curious on the, on the first name, for example, on the setter, because mm -hmm. you have to call the full name property change as well to update the full name. Uh, Yes. Yeah, so FODI is smart enough to realize that this is a derived property of those first two. So it can actually figure that out and do the code for you. So let me see if I can bring up a decompiler here, and maybe we can take a look at it. Do I have anything? Do I have IL Spy installed? I do. IL Spy. You guys familiar with decompilers at all? Yeah, I think we've all kind of played around with them. Reflector, IL Spy, Just Decompile, these are all good. Um, can we bring in my Notify Property Changed? Okay, so here is the Notify Property Changed assembly. I don't know if this is easy for you guys to read or not. But you can see I have my name view model. So I've decompiled this code, and now this is what it looks like. So I've got all this extra stuff in here that FODI is doing for me. So it's call, it's, it, it put in the interface here. It put in the event for me. It put in all these, I notif or these on property change methods for me. It added an on property change method for me. So it's doing all this work on my behalf. It's figuring out what the derived, uh, the derived properties are. Sweet. Yeah, so that's, that's a really uh, slick feature of FODI. Um, so, uh, FODI is uh, open source and uh, free. Uh, it's not super popular, but it's, uh, it's a very cool little tool that I think you should definitely spend some time playing with. And it does a lot of stuff besides just what I'm showing you here. There's stuff that allows you to write more generic aspects, like I showed you earlier today. Uh, there's stuff that will update your assemblies based on your Git branching and all, all kinds of cool stuff like that. So it's a, it's a very interesting little project. You should check it out. Uh, I have more with Notify Property Changed if you're interested, but I don't typically talk about this stuff too much. Yeah, what do you got for post sharp for iNotify? All right. Okay, so uh, with post sharp, I got a couple things I can show you here. So <clears throat> Uh, one thing I'll have to talk about here, and I, I, I usually hesitate to do this, but, but PostSharp is, there's a free version of PostSharp called PostSharp Express. And you need a license to use it, but it is a free license. So anyone can get a license to it, not a big deal. Um, there's also uh, more paid commercial versions of PostSharp. 
these come with more features, and one of those features is these um, sort of uh, pre-built aspects that you can apply to your code. So you don't have to write the aspect yourself. You can just drop it in. All right. So first what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what I could do with a free version of PostSharp. I wrote my own little notify property changed aspect here. It's not a great aspect. But here's my new MVVA model. So it's, it's a lot slimmer than the, the noisy C-sharp version, but I still have these, these aspects. So I'm putting this aspect on each of my properties. So I'm saying this property should notify when it's changed, and this property should notify when it's changed. And I also have this parameter here. It should also notify the full name is changed whenever this is set. All right, so a little more work for me here to do this. Let me show you my aspect here. Uh, again, I probably wouldn't use this in production. This is just something I whipped up really quick. This is a location and interception aspect. So instead of a method, now we're intercepting a location. Uh, I take in those derived parameters and store them as a just a field there. So the, the method I can overwrite is now called on set value. So instead of on invoke, like a method, we're now intercepting just the setter part of the property. So we're saying, okay, get the current value of the setter, get the value they're trying to set it to, compare them. If they're different, go ahead and, and proceed to set the actual underlying value. And then I want you to raise that this property was changed, so raise that event. And if there's any derived properties, go through all those properties and raise events for those as well. So that's, that's pretty straightforward. The, the part that's a mess that I wouldn't recommend you use is this raise property changed here. Um, it's using reflection to find that property changed event and, and raise it. So here I'm getting the handler here, and I'm just raising it with the instance. So that's going to be a little bit of overhead there to use reflection every time. Um, so it's not the best way. There are some better ways to do this. Uh, I just This is kind of they're a little more complex to show in a, in a demo setting like this, so I didn't really want to show that. Uh, but I'll just go ahead and demo this one for you. You can see that it works. So here's my post chart method. I'm turning, still working like before. Hopefully that's animating fast enough for you guys to see that it's happening as I type. Yeah, we see it. Okay. All right, so that's the way you can do it with the free version of PostSharp. So everything I've showed you up until this point of the presentation, you can do with PostSharp Express. No, no cost, totally free. Not open source, but it's totally free. All right? So what I'm about to show you now is not 100% free. So let's comment this one out. And let's, let's add this one here. So name view model. This represents sort of this, the same thing we saw with, with Fody, right? It's totally devoid of anything. It's just the properties and the derived property. Now, when you install PostSharp, it will install a little add-in to Visual Studio. It has a little drop-down box here. And one of those options, if you can read it, says implement I notify property changed. So if I click that, it's going to give me a little wizard and says, okay, I'm going to install a new package from NuGet called PostSharp Patterns Model. Uh, do this project. And, and I'm going to add a, a new attribute to your view model. Okay, sounds good. Hopefully this works. I tried this last night. Hopefully it still works. Okay, so it's been modified successfully. So now I've added a property to it called Notify Property Changed. I've added a new project or a new reference called Post Chart Patterns Model. All right. So I will go ahead and, and do this again. And you can see that it still works. And it's using this notify property changed attribute aspect that the post chart company has written themselves. So this is a much more robust, much better version of the aspect than what I've written. And just a quick demo. Uh, the, the catch here is that this is a sort of limited unless you purchase a, a commercial license from post chart. You, you can use this on 10 models for free. After that, you'll need to purchase the, the license. How much is the license? So it's, well, at, that, there's some variation there. Again, I don't want to be all like a salesman here because I'm not a post employee or anything, but 
Uh, here is a breakdown of licenses, so PostSharp Express is free. All those features I showed you in most of the session, those are all included for free. If we scroll down here to the iNotify property change feature, you can buy just that model pattern library, a full license for 150 bucks. And, or if you buy the ultimate version, it's included in the ultimate version. Otherwise, you get uh, 10 classes per project for free. So it's sort of just a way to try it out. I mean, I don't I imagine if you probably have more than 10 view models in a normal project, but uh, if you have a small, like a mobile project, maybe you can get away with that. So, again, uh, it's a great product. It's definitely worth it, but uh, I'm not here to sell you on PostSharp just to sort of show you some cool stuff. So. I'd be glad to answer any questions you have about licensing, but I don't want to spend too much time dwelling on that. All right, is that it? There? Oh, did we lose him? Offline? Did we lose internet? <laughs>